As Gordon mentioned, um, FIB commissions go over a full range of uh, very academic and very practical areas. Commission one is very much more at the uh, application end, what you do with all the knowledge that the whole FIB community has, has put together. Um, terms of reference, lots of words. The two words I like on this slide are innovation and imagination. And I think as a, method, as a mission statement for what we do in structural concrete, those are great words to take forward. The objectives, as of all these things, are about bringing together a whole range of skills, including uh, economy, durability, and also uh, increasingly sustainable development issues, although possibly not um, slag in cement, but there we are. Um, Commission One. Um, has a full range of the um, of structural concrete areas. Um, bridges, um, I note that um, uh, the, uh, the chair was Jean-Francois Klein, who um, I should say sadly passed away last year, uh, uh, last week rather. Uh, Jean-Francois, uh, one, one of the key designers of Third Bosphorus, um, he'll be sadly missed across the whole FIB community. Um, but the, the range is wide, and I think what I'd like to get from a little bit of, of this evening is to get involvement from the UK into some of, these, some of these commissions as well. So in that, in that regard, a really quick, because it's that, that time of the evening, a rundown of uh, some of the areas of the various task groups and uh, smaller subsets of areas that we're looking at. Um, if there are, are areas of interest, talk to myself or Chris and we can um, put you in the right direction. Um, what I've just done is go through which ones are active, so the ones you can join and have immediate, immediate impact, and those which are a little bit um, slower, so you, could, you can make the impact. Um, there is a document being prepared on bridges of high-speed trains. Um, they're meeting in, in Beijing, or sorry, in China um, later, in, later in the, later in the, in the, in the, uh, in the month. Um, integral bridges, a little bit slow. Um, light rail bridges, I'll mention in a second. And the management in precious concrete bridges, which um, uh, Gordon alluded to a little bit earlier. Light railway bridges, um, this is a new group. It's one that I've, I've joined recently. And it is, a, it is a group which is one of those pulling together groups. It's pulling together uh, current practice, some good practice of detailing, some of the differences in loading so that engineers who are not familiar with that type of structure have a starting point to work on. Um, we currently have very few members. So, given in the UK we're doing, we're doing a, few, a few of these structures, if your organisation or yourself are interested, it's one to join. We're starting up. We have an aim to get a document out, a state of the art report in about a year. Uh, we, we meet... Um, uh, every couple of months, um, virtually or physically. Um, and it's a very interesting one. It pulls together quite a lot of interesting things. Light rail's got a lot of, a lot of fun stuff. Um, geometry, you're in an urban area, you've got rail. Um, <coughs> yeah, you've got clients. Um, <laughs> sorry, to deal with. Um, um, some of the other uh, com, com one areas, um, Marine structures, um, there's a, a very interesting floating structures document which is, which is soon to come out. And there's a submerged floating tunnels group which is, which is just starting up. So those are structures which are concrete structures below the water, buoyant, but, but tied down. And that is a, that, that's going to be fun, I think. Um, there is a whole tranche of building, of building groups. Um, and there are also um, tunnels. Which, is, which I think is an area we don't necessarily think of, but I think those are areas that we should be, as, a, as, a, as an institution, as a group, going towards. Um, sustainability and history um, tend not to move quickly, as quickly as some other groups. Um, and the ground floors is, is active. Um, the, the commission that I'm most involved with um, is in construction. Um, and we were, we were a whole commission, so it was very much about bringing together construction and design, um, and we're evolved to be part of, uh, part of COM1. Um, our work going forward, as with many of the, uh, of, the, of the other task groups, is involved with inputting into 
um, uh, Model Code 2020 and updating the wider, wider good practice. But what we've been trying to do is um, look at the interaction between construction and design, uh, give guidance and go on good practice, um, and just general reminders to people. Um, and to do that, we are quite a, quite a wide-ranging commission. So we have members from, uh, from consultancy, from, from contracting, from academia as well. We have a reasonably good um, uh, cross-section uh, from, from the, the, the wider uh, concrete community, both directly and corresponding members. And I think one of the things that wasn't mentioned earlier, and maybe it should be, these are voluntary, but one of the ways of taking part in some of the commissions is to be a corresponding member. So you don't have to go to every single meeting, but you can, you can get documents circulated and you, can, and you can commit when you can, when you have some, some, some interesting points to make so that we as a concrete community can actually go forward. And so we have people from, from India and, and, and such like who don't always come to all the meetings, but can input from their perspective of the industry. Um, the, the, the previous work that we did on uh, in, the, in the commission, um, in, the, in the task group, uh, was around false work and form work um, and how that affects concrete um, uh, execution of concrete works and the things that you need to remember. Um, but what we've been doing over the last, um, I think, seven years, um, we took a long time, but it was very interesting and we had lots of, lots of very interesting and informative meetings, mainly in Paris. Um, was around precast segmental bridges. And this started out very much as trying to fill the, the gap between uh, how you design and how you build and to ensure that both parties come together uh, to produce the best possible product safely and effectively. Um, recently published, last year I think now, um, available from the FIB, from the institution, at a, a very reasonable rate. Um, it's uh, we are our method. Our um, mission statement for the for the for the um, guide was about in, informing the state of the art. Um, the state of the art moves, so it's uh, it's an idea about giving pointers to what you should be looking at, what you could look at, what you should ask about, where you should go in the rest of the FIB world for information. So we're not trying to tell you everything about. Um, about uh, plastic ducts or how connections work. There are other sources within FIB which are, which are really good for that. Um, but it's about ensuring that you have a link between construction and design. And in, in particular, in a, uh, in a segmental structure, the construction methodology has a strong influence on how you design. Your design has a strong influence on your construction. And there also goes through to, to how your bridge is articulated, both in temporary and, temporary and permanent states, the temporary loads. Some of the other little issues that you worry about as you're going through your design process. Um, it's not supposed to have been, or it wasn't, and it isn't, a design guide. It is a point of good practice. It's not a code. Um, and so it's not there to say, this is how you design a concrete structure. It's the pointer to, 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 as a reminder for ex engineers that can design concrete, but not necessarily segmental concrete, what the differences are and what you should be thinking about. So in that, in that sense, quite a practical document. Why? Um, I was having a discussion earlier. Um, the, in the UK, we, um, we had, that, we had the, uh, the moratorium on, on segmental structures. And at that point, um, a lot of knowledge got lost or misplaced. And I think um, segmental structures are one of those where having knowledge of what's going on is quite important. So if you, either if you don't know or you've forgotten, it's quite handy to understand, have a document about where you can look that is neutral. It's not someone, one person's view, it's, it's, a, it's a collective view about what you could do. So we talk about some of the benefits and such like. And um, the things I was just going to mention this evening are those three, those three areas. Something about the geometry, the things we need to think about, um, some additional loads, and um, 
some things that go wrong, apparently. So, what can you think about? Um, fundamentally, a segmental bridge is a production process. You are trying to maximize the amount of repetition in your, in your system. That's the whole point. Um, but of course, nothing is standard. This is engineering. There are always uh, things which are different. So you will always have, even if you try to have a standard segment and you do all your geometry so that everything is exactly the right size, there will always be things which are different. There are the piers which are different. Um, the abutment segment is going to be different. You have to do something where the segments join up. There will be a gap. What do you do there? Are you so good that your segments are exactly as, as you design them and they all fit? Or do you need a big steel beam to get everything to fit? What do you do in the gap? How do you actually form the concrete? How is you as a designer or the contractor, how do you think about the shape of your section to enable you to look at these vari variations and deal with these variations? Do you do everything in your formwork? Do you do everything as, as one hit? Do you do two-stage casting? If you're constrained by lift weight, for example, do you ensure that you, or do you try to have the minimum weight of your segment and where you have deviators, diaphragms, abutments, do you do a second stage pour, which may affect your program, which may affect your, your durability, which may affect safe method working, or do you say you need a bigger lift weight? Those are all decisions that actually you can make in design, which affect construction, and if, uh, if are changed at too late a stage in the construction, will affect the design. Peer segments. I, I, I just like peer segments um, because they are they one of those areas which are very complicated. Um, if you, depending on the type of construction methodology, you can get quite big changes in the behaviour at the peer. You can go from a, uh, an integral connection which you then need to make um, make um, more free, um, or you can end up with significant amounts of temporary works. So large amounts of temporary bars, holding down, pre-stressing temporarily, or you may end up with quite large uh, temporary works loads which may give out of balance loads. Do you know enough about this at, a, at an early stage of design? If you do, do you then constrain the later, the later construction processes? How much do you constrain those later construction processes? Unusual loads. Um, yes, so there are the obvious loads. You have a great big gantry sitting on your structure. That's putting, that's putting different loads in the temporary condition than you do in the permanent condition. Um, you also have to worry about the stability. Somebody somewhere needs to make sure that your several hundred tons of, of launching gantry, in this case in Hong Kong, on a curve, in a windy environment, is not going to fall off. What that may require is locations at which you have to have significant tie downs onto your deck. Do your, do your, does your deck then work? Does your pier then work? Your temporary condition can start governing your permanent condition. And you have the all, you have the, uh, the interesting question about whose ownership is it? Is it a temporary works issue? It's a permanent works issue. In the end, it's all our issues if we are part of that design team. Um, ah, casting. So the reason Detra of a segmental bridge is to is to make segments in a small enough section so you can have a repetitive um, process during the during the construction. Um, one of the most, of, one of the most uh, common ways of doing this these days is to match cast, so you cast one segment against another. But uh, in this case, when you have quite long, thin segments, you end up with thermal effects causing uh, bowing of the section. You also end up stacking segments quite frequently so that your, your construction process can, has, is then, has enough reservoir material to then, uh, to then um, um, uh, follow, but you then get stacking of segments and then creep effects on the on the segments. Is the section is the segment that you actually erect the one that you started designing? 
what is a safe method story? Can you stack three segments or, uh, high or four segments high? Can you design for that? Do you, want, do you need to prop the, the cantilevers? I don't need an answer to many of these, by the way. Um, uh, um, I think one of the areas that we'll most think about in the in interaction of design and construction is around uh, post tensioning. Um, this is uh, an example of where you have a, a, a cantilever construction. So you're cantilevering out from a pier, ending up with quite a lot of top pre stressing. Now, if you use permanent pre stressing for this, which is which is an option, it's quite a constructible option. You then have to then balance that quite high top pre-stress with quite a lot of bottom pre-stress. So there's a balance between um, construction stresses perm uh, and, the perm and the permanent stresses, permanent pre-stress and potentially temp temporary <coughs> pre-stress. How much temporary pre-stress can you get away with? What does that do to the construction program and process? If you have a lot of temporary bars that you need to stress and de-stress, Compared with one hit on on, the, on, the, on permanent tendons, what's what's beneficial for your particular uh, situation? Um, one of the benefits of uh, segmental construction should be that you're working in more controlled conditions when you're doing the fabrication. So you should be able to have more axial reinforcement. Um, you do have to end up lifting cages. So you're not a, you, you're working big big size. Um, you should be able to, if you wish to, optimize your reinforcement a bit more. There are pros and cons in doing that. Um, I tend to be in a camp of wanting to keep the reinforcement reasonably standard. Um, however, if you wanted to, you could, and some people have done this, optimize reinforcement in every single segment. I think that's a false economy personally, but that's my view. Others may have different views. Um, on concrete, there is the clear benefit of uh, being able to batch in the factory conditions, um, and you're, you, you can vibrate the moulds rather, rather than using pokers within the segment, so you can potentially achieve a slightly better finish on, on the concrete as well. Um, the downside of that, especially in, in the, the way we're looking at, it, looking at things now, is that you're in multiple handling mode. You need to handle large lumps of concrete, transport them further from a single site to your, to your construction face. Is that better, especially in carbon terms, in transport terms, than doing work on site? Open question, not sure. Um, and there's also the, I mentioned carbon, uh, um, a slag earlier on. If you wanted to use uh, a higher amount of, of GGBS in your, in your mix, better for carbon, but it also has an effect on, uh, on um, curing times. And in a, in, a, in a segmental structure, you want to be able to get your segment out of the mold as quickly as you can to reuse it. What's the balance there? Um, lastly, um, just some interesting things on, um, which it looks really bad in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a big size, but um, things that go wrong, I should note, um, these are all non-attributable, and none of these are mine. Um, <laughs> but it's so, if you're reusing formwork, one of the things is the formwork does does wear, and if you don't maintain it, you get leaks between the between the panels of the of the form, um, and so you get you get little bits of uh, of, of issues at the, at the end. Ah, oh, pre-stressing. Um, pre-stressing does does quite often have um, issues <laughs> issues with with bursting. Um, I think the particular difference in a, in a segmental bridge, you have a lot of, lot of places where you have blisters and anchorages. Um, quite often, every other segment can have a blister and anchorage. And so the, the opportunity to have inaccuracies in, in placement, both geometric and uh, the concreting, are higher. Um, and there is always a tendency to try to reduce your lift weight. And so your slabs get a little bit thin and things don't quite work. Um, the detailing issue here is really because we're, uh, we have a second phase activity. We've got, the temporary, we've got the temporary tendon as well. So quite often people remember about bursting of your, of your main tendons. But when you start putting additional blisters in, are you connecting your, 
your secondary blisters to your to your main slab properly. Um, have you, do you, have you have you done it as the as, as part of the inte integral part of the design, or have you done it as a bit of an afterthought? Um, and of course, because your segments, um, you have two two concrete surfaces meeting each other, and occasionally you can get hard spots between them. And when you stress against a hard spot, you can get cracks. So sorry, local local stresses which cause issues. So just to conclude. The raison d'etre of, of, of Tarsu 1.7 is about integrating construction and, um, and theory and a bit of design. And I think that's quite fun. That's kind of what a lot of practicing engineers do anyway, or try to do. And this is setting out so that the, the wider community can, can, share, can share our knowledge. As I mentioned earlier, and the other speakers have mentioned, a lot of the effort in FIB is moving at the moment towards Model Code 2020. So as construction, uh, we are in incorporating to that, especially in the areas of reuse and dismantlement. Um, uh, it's, it goes with the assessment part. It's the holistic part of, um, of, um, of, of, uh, of FIB and the work. Um, and I should also um, um, just note, if anyone's got anything interesting for us to do after Model Code 2020, we'll also need to know. And as I mentioned earlier, big range, please get involved. Thank you.